I'd like to go over my approach to hypothyroidism and Hashimoto's thyroiditis and the neurological and musculoskeletal problems that go along with these conditions. Hypothyroidism is often thought of as a disease that affects the body metabolism. It certainly does. However, there can be very many more problems that go along with autoimmune thyroid disease like Hashimoto's thyroiditis and hypothyroidism, such as neuropathy and arthritis, and that's what I'm talking about today. A disclaimer here, I'm not a medical doctor, so I do not give advice about medications. I'm a chiropractor, and I see a lot of neurological and musculoskeletal problems that have a root in thyroid disease, and that's why I pay so much attention to thyroid disease in my practice. And I've learned a lot about how to look at these disorders and how they relate to thyroid disease, and I've come up with a treatment regimen of my own to help out with some of the nerve and joint and muscle problems that go along with thyroid disease. These are some of the most common musculoskeletal problems that go along with thyroid disease and Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Ligament laxity is something I see very commonly. Hyperextension of the knees and elbows are very common. I don't have any specific numbers as far as the prevalence in thyroiditis, but I've noticed this very often. Frozen shoulders are very common. Crystal deposition in the joints is very common in patients with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Dupuy trans contractures, a disorder of the tendon in the finger. Trigger finger. Osteoarthritis is very common. Degenerative disc disease, something I deal with a lot as a chiropractor, is very frequently related to Hashimoto's thyroiditis, fibromyalgia syndrome, myopathy, muscle cramps, aching, and pain, and very commonly, autoimmune diseases go hand in hand with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, such as Sjogren's, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, and scleroderma. About 15% of patients with Hashimoto's thyroiditis will have another autoimmune disease. These are some of the neurological problems that go along with hypothyroidism and Hashimoto's thyroiditis. 30% of patients will have headache. Myokymia, the twitching of muscles. Dysautonomia, problems with regulation of the autonomic nervous system are very common. One example is Raynaud's phenomenon, a constriction of blood vessels into the hand, causing uh, cold hands and decreased blood flow into the fingers. In Hashimoto's thyroiditis, there's typically a increase in the reaction and the upregulation of the sympathetic nervous system, and there's a downregulation of the parasympathetic nervous system. Paresthesia pins and needles in the extremities is very common. Carpal tunnel syndrome, the median nerve in the wrist, is very common in Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Weakness affecting the proximal muscles closer to the center of the body. Polyneuropathy affecting the distal nerves. And rarely there can be seizures and movement disorders, involuntary movements, even sometimes tremors can occur in Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And this is when antibodies affect the central nervous system. How do all these things happen? One explanation is that the active form of thyroid hormone, T3, triiodothyronine, has so many diverse functions and effects on the body. One function that it has is it stimulates the fibroblasts the cells within our ligaments and tendons to produce type 1 collagen. And it does so at a genetic level. It increases the genetic expression of type 1 collagen. And in doing so, it helps build strong ligaments and tendons. A lot of the conditions I spoke of earlier, Dupuy trans contractures, even disc herniations, there's collagen in all of the connective tissue of our body. And so if you are deficient in the active form of thyroid hormone, you can have a problem with collagen. T3 
it also stimulates the oligodendrocytes and the Schwann cells, which wrap myelin around our nerves. It stimulates these cells to increase the genetic expression of myelin, which is the insulation around our nerves. And going back to carpal tunnel syndrome, polyneuropathy, this could explain a lot of these conditions. T3, it also stimulates the cartilage cells, the chondrocytes, to mature and produce type 2 collagen. Type 2 collagen is the collagen found in our joints, in the cartilage. So I'm connecting a lot of dots here and I'm putting a lot of pieces together of this puzzle, a lot of basic cellular biology research with the clinical research and seeing what the connections are. And this is what I found. I found that because thyroid hormone has so many effects on the body, this is why the musculoskeletal problems start to arise and the neurological problems start to arise is that when you don't have T3 to a sufficient level, you cannot keep these structures healthy enough. Another reason why neurological and musculoskeletal problems arise in thyroid disease is the presence of antibodies. Antithyroid antibodies are very common, the antithyroid peroxidase and antithyroid globulin. However, there's other antibodies that come into play with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. There's very many. There's anti-nuclear antibodies, and then there's a whole bunch of ones that are lesser known. Examples are anti-collagen antibodies, and these affect the collagen that I spoke of in the ligaments and tendons of the body, and the presence of anti-collagen antibodies may explain some of the arthritis that goes on in Hashimoto's thyroiditis. There's also anti-calcequestrin, and other types of anti-collagen antibodies, and there's a chemokine called CXCL10. These are associated with myositis and myopathy. Classically, it's best been studied in eye muscles. However, it's looking at this, we can start to think maybe affects the other muscles in the body because collagen's everywhere and it's not just in the eyes. So people are looking at these molecules now for the whole body and not just the eyes. And we don't know everything there is to know, but we do know that there's this polyclonal antibody response where you have a lot of antibodies that are attacking different structures in the body. And a lot of this is brought on by Hashimoto's thyroiditis and autoimmune disease. CXCL10 has also been associated with carpal tunnel syndrome. That's not to say that it causes carpal tunnel syndrome altogether. There's a lot of other things at play here. There's also the formation of myxedema, and that is a buildup of mucopolysaccharides, like a mucus-like fluid, in the body, and it accumulates within the wrist and can compress upon the median nerve that goes through the wrist. The way I like to think of this is that there's a deficiency or problem with the collagen, so the body is creating this mucopolysaccharides as a compensatory mechanism. That's how I think of this. I put together this table of a lot of other antibodies that are related to Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And you can see the prevalence of anti-nuclear antibodies, very common in Hashimoto's thyroiditis. This relates to things like lupus and different types of myositis, as well as other autoimmune diseases. Anti-calcequestrin, cardiolipin, double-stranded DNA antibodies are very, very common. Endomesial, some of the celiac disease antibodies are present. And anti-sodium iodide symporter, that one may relate to just hypothyroidism itself. Anti-NAE, that relates to the ataxia and the seizures and the myoclonus and the movement disorders that I spoke of earlier relating to encephalopathy. There are antiphospholipid antibodies, anti rho that relates to Sjogren syndrome, single-stranded DNA, thyroglobulin, TPO, the thyroid peroxidase, those two, the thyroglobulin and the thyroid peroxidase, those are 
the ones that are classically related to Hashimoto's thyroiditis. These other ones are all just related to other autoimmune diseases or just inflammation and problems with other parts of the body that I'm talking about. Rheumatoid factor, rheumatoid arthritis, there's some overlap with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And so the presence of these antibodies doesn't necessarily mean that you have a separate autoimmune disease. You could just have Hashimoto's thyroiditis with the presence of things like anti-nuclear antibodies. It doesn't mean you have an additional autoimmune disease, but you could. And I've talked with some patients that have had these and are wondering, do I have lupus? And you do not necessarily have lupus. You could just have the presence of the antinuclear antibodies because the antibody response in Hashimoto's disease is often a polyclonal or a nonspecific antibody response where you're building up just a, a load of antibodies against various different structures. But there is an overlap of Hashimoto's thyroiditis with other autoimmune diseases. And you can, at times, have two different things. You can have rheumatoid arthritis or celiac disease and Hashimoto's. Selenium is one of the most important micronutrients for the thyroid gland, but also the entire thyroid hormone system. One of the reasons why is that it is part of the enzyme called diiodinase. And this diiodinase enzyme is present in the thyroid, but as well it's also present in the entire body. And what it does is it converts the inactive thyroid hormone that the thyroid gland produces, T4, and converts it into the active thyroid hormone, T3. And it also takes reverse T3, which is something you don't really want. It blocks T3 and it converts that into T2. So selenium is a component of the diiodinase enzyme. And if you do not have enough selenium, your diiodinase is not going to work properly and you're not going to get enough T3. It's been shown that in patients with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, they're very commonly deficient in selenium. And if they supplement with selenium, 200 micrograms per day, they can actually raise the free T3 to free T4 ratio over time. They can actually raise the amount of T3 because they're supporting the conversion with the deiodinase of T4 to T3. And this is extremely important because even if the thyroid hormone is producing enough T4 it's basically useless unless you convert it into T3. So that's where selenium comes in. A lot of the deiodinase enzymes are seen in the liver. There's also some in the kidney, but basically they're throughout the entire body. And so selenium helps you utilize the thyroid hormones by activating deiodinase. In order to get 200 micrograms of selenium, and that's the amount that you may need to stimulate the deiodinase, you can eat four Brazil nuts per day. You can also eat a couple servings of tuna, but Brazil nuts are the highest source of selenium in the diet. Selenium is important for another reason. It is part of the enzyme called glutathione peroxidase. And what glutathione peroxidase does is it produces something called glutathione. And that's our body's most important endogenous antioxidant, especially in the thyroid gland. It's a very important antioxidant in the thyroid gland. Now what glutathione does in the thyroid gland is it prevents oxidative damage. When thyroid hormones are produced in that process, the thyroid cells generate something called hydrogen peroxide. And the hydrogen peroxide that's generated is in higher levels, and it's a high concentration in the thyroid gland. And it can actually damage the thyroid gland and damage the DNA and the proteins and the different parts of the thyroid cells. So, as I said before, many patients with Hashimoto's thyroiditis are deficient in selenium. 
they don't have a very well functioning glutathione peroxidase and they probably don't have enough glutathione. When patients with, with Hashimoto's thyroiditis supplement with selenium, they actually decrease the amount of anti-thyroid antibodies and that is really great because this is one of the few things that can actually get rid of anti-thyroid antibodies. You can see that these gray bars here are patients taking selenium, 200 micrograms per day, and the white bar is the placebo. All of these patients are taking synthetic T4 thyroxine. So the patients taking 200 micrograms of selenium reduced their anti-thyroid peroxidase antibodies Every three months, over a span of a year, it was measured in this one study. There's actually been multiple studies that have measured this, and they've all achieved similar results. Now, there's one study out there that showed that selenium had no effect on the antibodies. What I saw is they only measured for three months, and there's another study that, that didn't use enough patients, but from what I can tell, selenium has a lot of evidence behind it that it can actually lower the anti-thyroid antibodies. And it does so by stimulating the glutathione peroxidase's production of glutathione. Glutathione prevents the hydrogen peroxide-induced oxidative damage to the DNA and to the thyroid cells. And that prevents the production of anti-thyroid antibodies. The reason why here the antithyroid antibodies are generated is because when the DNA and the different structures within the thyroid cells is damaged, the purple dots here, these lymphocytes of the immune system come in and they generate antibodies against these nucleic acids and proteins because when the proteins and nucleic acids are oxidized, and they're damaged by hydrogen peroxide, they actually change form, and the immune system recognizes that they're abnormal, and it produces antibodies against them. So we'll see things like anti-nuclear antibodies and anti-double-stranded DNA antibodies, and the different antibodies that go with all the components of the thyroid cells, and, and that's why these things leak out and start to attack the joints and the collagen and the, the other structures in the body. It's the polyclonal antibody response that is initiated from the oxidative damage in the thyroid. So selenium will help fight against the antithyroid antibodies that's been proven. As far as getting rid of the other antibodies, that's not been proven, but it is a theoretical way to go about it. There's also other things that can be done to boost glutathione in the thyroid. Vitamin C boosts glutathione methyl sulfonyl methane or MSM also boosts glutathione and that's why I'm starting to recommend these to patients with musculoskeletal and neurological problems that relate to thyroid disease. Typically recommend 200 micrograms of selenium per day. We start at around 1,000 of milligrams or one gram of vitamin C per day but everyone's unique with vitamin C and you can go up to what's called a bowel tolerance dose. You increase slowly every day and you find when your bowels start to run a little faster and then you back down. MSM, methyl sulfonyl methane, three to six grams per day. I tell people one to two teaspoons. What I like to do is actually get a powdered form of vitamin C and MSM and mix them together in a drink morning and evening is how I like to do that and that will help with glutathione peroxidase and there's other benefits as well that I want to get into. Vitamin C actually as I didn't say before but vitamin C helps with the deiodinase enzyme as well. So it's been shown that things like cadmium, lead, and certain types of pesticides interfere with the deiodinase Vitamin C has been shown to basically rescue the deiodinase and get it working again. So vitamin C is important for many reasons. A 
another reason why vitamin C is important in the musculoskeletal problems that go along with thyroid disease is that it increases the genetic expression of type 1 collagen. It also helps with the bond formation in the collagen proteins. So it does a lot to help out with collagen. And if you remember from before, a lack of T3 causes a lack of collagen gene expression and collagen production. So vitamin C will help restore that. Methyl sulfonylmethane or MSM helps with type 2 collagen and that's the collagen that's found in cartilage or the joints and so this can be very helpful for arthritis. Ascorbic acid is just another term for vitamin C. Iodine, probably one of the most controversial supplements for the thyroid. Some doctors say it's great other doctors say you should avoid it at all costs if you have Hashimoto's thyroiditis. My perspective is this. Some patients do benefit from it. Others will actually suffer from it and have an adverse response. And I've seen that. Not in patients I've treated, but in patients I've spoken with. And my approach to this is, number one, you can actually get tested to see if you're deficient in iodine. There's different tests out there. There's the urine tests and the blood tests, basically anything except the skin test because I don't know how reliable that is. Anyways, if you do decide to supplement with iodine, I would recommend working with a doctor. But anyways, when you do it, I would definitely start off at a lower supplement level, less than a milligram a day, and seeing how you tolerate that and then working up. And that's what I do with my patients. One of my favorite sources of iodine to eat is actually wakame salad, and I get this at sushi places, have it, and it, it tastes great, and you can eat this once a week or once a month or however often you need to keep your iodine at a proper level. Iodine has other benefits aside from what it does in the thyroid is it incorporates itself into T4. T4 has four iodines in it and T3 has three so it's a part of the thyroid hormones and that's why people recommend to take it but in addition to that it's lesser known fact that iodine is an antioxidant it can actually lower C-reactive protein get rid of reactive oxygen species and interleukin-6 which can sometimes be problems with arthritis and can be seen in different inflammatory conditions there are different adaptogens that can be used to help with thyroid conditions. Google is one of the best known and it has been used for 2,500 years. This ancient Ayurvedic medical text, the Sashruta Samhita, describes that in patients that are gaining weight and have waist building up and Vayu is problems with the nerve force and poor circulation. So patients that had all these qualities benefited from Google and this has been researched up through modern day and it has been shown that this can actually help stimulate the thyroid and I've seen that this can have quick effects but however not everyone needs it and you may just start off with the nutritional supplements and work your way from there. And again I am not a medical doctor so there are plenty of options out there including medications and I don't deter people from getting the help they need and I just lay the options out there for people to choose. This is one option. One thing that can really interfere with the thyroid system is stress and that can come in the form of cortisol. Cortisol is a stress hormone that can block the conversion of T4 into the active thyroid hormone T3. It actually interferes with the deiodinase enzyme and that was the enzyme that selenium and vitamin C help with. Cortisol also builds up reverse T3 which is something you don't want and it can actually reduce TSH as well. In the yogic traditions the throat chakra was associated with the thyroid gland. It was said that and it still is thought that if the emotions are not expressed properly, 
then the thyroid gland will suffer. And this correlates well with the Western medical approach of cortisol interfering with the thyroid gland. It overlaps very well, and it's been shown that in patients that are, are very stressed, such as patients who have been war refugees, for example, have thyroid disease more commonly. There are lots of ways to get rid of stress from the body. There are some meditation techniques. There's yoga. There's even essential oils can be helpful, and lavender is probably the best studied at getting rid of cortisol. To recap, there are a lot of neurological and musculoskeletal problems that go along with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, carpal tunnel syndrome, arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, myositis, muscle pain, nerve pain, pins and needles, neuropathy, and one of the reasons is that T3, the active thyroid hormone, is responsible for helping us make collagen, which is found in the ligaments and tendons of the body. It helps with myelin around the nerves, and it helps with uh, cartilage as well. So if you don't have enough T3, those structures will suffer. There's also antithyroid antibodies and loads of other antibodies that can attack the collagen, the muscles, and the nerves. One of the ways to get rid of the antibodies from the system is to take selenium, and that can help get rid of antithyroid antibodies. Selenium also boosts glutathione, and it does so by boosting glutathione. There's other things that can boost glutathione and prevent the oxidative damage, vitamin C and MSM. 200 micrograms of selenium, 1,000 going upward of vitamin C, and one or two teaspoons a day of MSM. That's what I start patients with that have musculoskeletal and nerve problems from thyroid disease. There's also cortisol to look at, and stress reduction techniques can be very helpful. Sometimes iodine and even adaptogens like Google, ashwagandha, and ginseng can be helpful. So here are my references for that table I showed earlier with the different antibodies that can be seen in thyroid disease. And I hope to hear all kinds of questions in the comments. And I hope that was very helpful for anyone with thyroid disease.